Hi, welcome back to Not So Obvious Watches. I'm Pete McConville, and this is my analysis of Rolex's releases at Watches and Wonders 2021. Before I go on, I should probably let you know I'm disinterested in Rolex, and by that I mean I don't own a Rolex, I haven't owned a Rolex, I'm unlikely to own a Rolex in the past, in the future. I am an outsider. Um, that doesn't mean I'm uninterested in Rolex. I f I'm like those guys who watch those Netflix specials on cults. Intensely glad I'm not part of it, but endlessly fascinated by what they're doing. That's kind of my relationship to Rolex. Being an outsider like that has some advantages. It makes you a bit more clear-eyed, I think, sometimes about what they're trying to achieve. It gives you the ability to kind of look at the community and figure out what's going in, on inside the community without necessarily taking sides. On the other hand though, there is a problem. I'm kind of oblivious to a lot of the more subtle details. I don't really pay attention to some of the nuance in what they do in parts of their collection. If you want that sort of coverage, you're gonna to have to go look to someone else. Okay, so before I go on, we should probably talk about how I look at Rolex at all. To do this, I'm going to steal some words from Ariel Adams, one of my favorite watch journalists. In fact, probably the only watch journalist I can think of offhand. Anyway, he described Rolex this way back in 2013, and he just nails it for me. Imagine a spaceship flying through space on a very serious mission. The spaceship even has people on board who can improve the ship while it's in motion. When the spaceship left Earth, it was told it had a sole mission, to travel as far into space as possible. For me, that totally summarizes Rolex. Their prime purpose in life is to survive. Profit, growth, industry leadership, they're all nice, take it when you can get it, but they're not the prime purpose of Rolex. So if you want to understand Rolex and what they're doing with their watches and catalogs, always have that in mind. When you do think about their watches and their catalogue, remember they have two distinct parts. The first part is their core, their survival kit, their lifeboat, you'll hear me say. Um, that lifeboat are the steel sports watches that were around just before, during, and just after the quartz crisis. And there is a couple of precious metals in there as well, but not many. Those are Rolex's band of brothers. Those are Rolex's happy place. Those are Rolex's safe harbor. In times of trouble, that's where Rolex knows it can retreat to and survive anything. In the good times, be careful not to overextend. Be careful not to overinvest. Don't let hubris take control. And instead, use those to generate exclusivity to sell your profit takers. Which brings us to what are the profit takers? It's essentially everything else. Sky Dwellers, Yacht Master 2s, Cellinis, gem sets, precious metals, that sort of thing. They're disposable. They're where Rolex can play a little bit. That said, Rolex can only play insofar as those watches do not upset the core, don't risk the long-term integrity of the lifeboat, and can be discarded if needed. Okay, so that's how I see Rolex and Rolex watches. Here's the intro. I'll see you on the other side and we'll get into the analysis. Okay, so let's get into my analysis of Rolex's Watches and Wonders 2021 releases. May as well start with their core or their lifeboat pieces. The most obvious place to start there is the Explorer. Headline, it went from 39 down to 36 millimeters, caught a lot of people by surprise. In retrospect, whilst I didn't pick it, I don't know why it's such a surprise. And on top of that, it got the standard improvements Rolex would always give to a watch like this. New movement where one's available, so got it. New loom where new loom's available, so got it. And it looks like there's been some subtle changes to the case as well. But really the big talking point here is the change in size. A lot of people have been taken aback, and I think that's largely because there's a lot of myths attached to Rolex that aren't true. 
Rolex doesn't care what the community thinks. I don't think that's entirely true. Rolex never goes backwards. I certainly don't think that's true. Rolex doesn't like to admit it's wrong. Uh, that is certainly not true. Rolex is remarkably free of ego in that term. Rolex has shown it understands the community very clearly. Um, Rolex has always shown an ability to remove, to move back from a previous decision. I think what people miss is because they focus on external behaviors, but they don't think hard enough about the motivations of Rolex. And again, if you look at the motiva the essential motivation of Rolex of being survival, then the move from 39 to 36 millimeters makes total sense. Um, Rolex doesn't have a lot of watches in its core lifeboat collection that appeal to smaller men, Asian demographics and women. The Oyster Perpetual, yes, but most of the other watches in their core collection tend to be larger watches. The Submariner, the GMT Master, the Sky Dweller, all of those are 40 millimeters and above. Taking that core lifeboat collection, expanding its its reach demographically by bringing it back down to 36 millimeters makes total sense. It's essentially a no risk move for Rolex too. They're paying attention to the market. They know that people like having the smaller watch. They know that people want to return back to um, the 36 millimeter and they've had the 36 millimeter in the past and it was pretty successful. So really this was a no risk smart move by Rolex to reinforce the long-term sustainable demand for that watch. Really clever and in retrospect, pretty obvious. Now we get down to the Explorer 2, which was having a 50th birthday. So lots of people are expecting all sorts of things. Apparently some dash of green is a anniversary thing for a Rolex watch. Um, a lot of people were th assuming that we'd go to a ceramic bezel because that's what's happened in a lot of other uh, watches. I don't think any of that was ever on the cards. I said in my, I didn't really do a prediction video for Rolex, but what I thought was they wouldn't do much across the board. Um, I did make a suggestion that I didn't think they were going to follow, but that's a different kettle of fish. Okay, so... I, I never thought they were going to do a big update to the Explorer 2. And I'll tell you why I think that, how I think Rolex kind of works in this space. In general, as I've said a couple of times, Rolex has this core collection that they don't mess with. If they're going to mess with a Submariner or a GMT Master or something like that, they do it in increments either because within the steel line they feel like they have some redundancy or they can generate a, a disposable precious metal version for them to experiment in. Neither of those were really available for the Explorer 2. Take the take the Submariner for example. The Submariner has a two really core versions, a black dial, black bezel, no date and date version. Okay, so that's the core. And they're not, that is so popular and that is so well known that they are then able to run essentially a redundant watch alongside that. The redundant watch can be green, it can be a Kermit, it can be a Hulk, it can be whatever you, ever Rolex really wants. Um, safe in the knowledge that it's always a redundant watch compared to the core watch that they need to always be there, the black on black. The Explorer 2 doesn't have that luxury. There's, there is a white dial and a there's the polar dial and the black dial, but Rolex probably didn't feel that they have sufficient demand in those two to generate a third experimental color. Um, so I think that that was probably never going to happen. The other option, of course, would be to play around in the precious metal version. Rolex has shown that they love saying, if we're going to try ceramic, we'll do it on the white gold or the platinum. If we're going to, if we're going to try meteorite, we'll do that on a platinum version, see how it goes. Um, it is very rare, if not, I don't think I've seen it, where Rolex has experimented in their core collection. And again, the Explorer 2 probably can't justify, well, doesn't even have a precious metal version right now. 
and if the explorer was going to um, have this kind of experimentation, it would need that kind of sandbox. Uh, so yeah, what I what we got for the Explorer Two was pretty standard and was probably entirely foreseeable. Okay, the other change that happened in the core or lifeboat collection is the GMT Master now gets a choice of bracelet you, in steel. Anyway, you can get the Oyster or the Jubilee. That's hardly interesting, not really exciting, but I'm going to bring it up because it really illustrates my point of the steel collection, that core collection, always getting a degree of priority and Rolex always working to make sure that the long-term, sustainable, resilient, integral demand of those watches is secured. And what they felt was, I, I think, what they felt was the move from the Oyster to the Jubilee had upset that core group by simply making the Oyster available to them, which is a very easy, very simple change for Rolex to make. They can placate that group and at essentially no cost reinforce the long-term sustainable demand for that watch. In that potent in from that view, it's a fairly obvious move. And that's interesting, but it's not the whole story. I think the whole story comes when you look at the what the impact of that is on the people who bought the precious metal version, those people who wanted to buy the gold version just so that they got the bracelet choice they wanted. And what you see here is Rolex clearly prioritizing the long-term resilience of its core steel group over any short-term impact to the profit-taking watches over here on the precious metal side. If they have to make a choice between long-term resilience of steel versus short-term feelings around precious metal, steel will win every single time. Okay, well, that really brings us to the profit-taking parts of what Rolex has done here. Now, as always, there's a bunch of things that move around here relatively small to people like me as outsiders but to insiders they're really big and that's things like putting jubilees on things and oyster flexes on things and meteorites here and gem setting there look i don't really cover that stuff so if you do go to rolex tube you know guys like mike goldberg and stuff they will cover this in detail i i'm not interested within the profit taking area i saw really two Interesting moves. The first was the Explorer in the 36 millimeter now going two-tone. Um, clearly, anyone paying any attention knows that that's really, uh, really a vexed question for a lot of um, Rolex people. It's really thrown uh, kind of thrown some meat into the, the, the dog fighting pit between parts of the Rolex community. Those people who desperately hang on to the tool watch, the mountain climbing, the this is what the watch that went up or maybe didn't go up, um, Everest, versus those people who are just either completely into or at least accepting of the whole luxury thing. Um, it's a really interesting watch from that perspective. Clearly, Rolex felt that um, they could thread that needle with this watch. Clearly, they felt that whatever happens next is probably going to be bearable by them. That their Rolex, that that the two communities would eventually live together, and I think you can already see that happening. You can already see the people. The, if you like, the old school Rolex folk who really don't like the two-tone are already kind of getting used to the idea that there is this other watch out there um, and still being happy that at least they can get their, their straight steel model. Um, so why did they do that? Why did they take this risk at all? Well, really, money. 
Um, from what I understand, uh, two-tone watches in themselves are very popular in Asia. So here you go. That's out. That's probably their single biggest market. So why wouldn't you want to be a, appeal to them? In the West, uh, two-tone itself is has less intrinsic. Uh, demand, but is certainly an excellent gateway to um, full gold. And so by offering the this model in uh, two-tone, it gets people used to the idea of spending 15, 16,000 US on an Explorer, sets them up for the idea that they might be spending 20, 30,000 dollars, if not on a full gold Explorer, maybe something else later. So the addition of that that another bridge um, from entry-level um, lifeboat steel into more profitable watches lighter is always going to be welcome. And you can see why Rolex kind of did it here. When we talk about the date just dials, I think was the other interesting move here. Now, Rolex has always done funky dials before, but they've tended to be just different in character to these. Um, they've normally been dials around including gem sets or including the word Rolex or, or other things like that. Um, this one is, this feels different. Now, I'm going to say something that I need to be very clear on. I am not for one instant saying that Rolex has knocked off, copied, whatever, Grand Seiko here. But what I would say is that these watches, these dials have that kind of feel, have that kind of Grand Seiko feel. What do I think has happened here? I think Rolex has simply noticed that there is a hole in the market, that Rolex have noticed that Grand Seiko has generated a lot of buzz, a lot of hype. They've created a true iconic watch based on a funky, classy dial. The Snowflake is almost by definition now an icon. Um, it is routinely used as the basis of comparison. Is this the new snowflake? Is this the snowflake killer? Um, is this a, a comparison to the snowflake? Those sorts of statements are the indicator that a watch has become an icon in some way. Rolex isn't dumb. <laughs> Rolex, if anything, has shown that they have amazing business sense. They know that these kinds of dials can generate buzz. These kinds of dials can generate income. They've probably, just like with the Explorer two-tone model, taken a calculated gamble that they can lean into this space, produce this kind of product, probably upset some of their core users, but not so much that they would abandon the brand. And at the same time, they can bring in some more money. So I would suggest that that was exactly what uh, Rolex was thinking here. And again, just like with the two-tone, if you do a careful review of kind of try and gauge the feelings of social media here, I'd say Rolex has threaded that needle really nicely. Yes, there are people who really don't like the palm trees. Most people seem to be on board with the uh, the fluted dial, possibly because it looks like stacks of gold bullion, but maybe not. Um, but yes, there are people who really don't like them, but they seem to be gritting their teeth and going, well, at least I can still get my classics, so I'll live with it. Okay, so that was my take on Rolex. Not really ground shaking, not really earth shattering, but that's how I see this. Rolex is just Rolex this year, doing what they always do. I think what they did this year, though, in some cases, really works well to illustrate how they work across the board. And if we learn the lessons that Rolex has shown us here, we'll have a much better idea of how to understand them moving forward. I've been Pete McConville. This has been Not So Obvious Watches, and I'll see you later. Bye.